starring Claude Rains in Soldier of a Free Press, an original radio play on the Cavalcade of America, sponsored by the DuPont Company. This summer, Winston Churchill said, quote, there has never been a war where so much liberty has been given to war correspondents. They have been allowed to take their chance of being killed and to send home very full messages. This is what the press has always asked for, and this is what they got. End quote. No greater tribute could be paid to the freedom of the press, for only with a free press could war correspondents be expected to bring to their readers the news of this global war. Winston Churchill's words were indirectly a tribute to Richard Harding Davis. For it was the career of this first great war correspondent that helped make the world realize the urgency of getting war news direct from fighting front. Tonight, with Claude Rains in the title role, the Cavalcade of America presents Soldier of a Free Press, a new radio play based on the career of Richard Harding Davis, Soldier of a Free Press. <laughs> Richard Harding Davis was born in the Civil War year, 1864, under a star that was red with blood. In his career as a newspaper man, he was to cover many great events, the Johnstown Flood, the coronation of a Russian czar, the Diamond Jubilee of Queen Victoria. But the fame of Richard Harding Davis is built on the world's wars, and it began in 1897, when he was assigned to report the attempt of the Cuban people to overthrow the yoke of the Spanish aristocracy. But it was no easy job getting news in Havana. Well, what are you up to, Dick? Sending a cable back to New York. As usual, nothing happened in Cuba today except of the brutal and barbaric punitive nature. Signed, Richard Harding Davis. I'm getting fed up. Go oh, on. Sit back. Relax, Dick. Look out on the Prado. Get a sunburn. Life is very pleasant down here. Very pleasant. The nearest we've gotten to the alleged war is to hear those poor devils being shot by the firing squad. Back of the Cabana's fortress. I must say I haven't your scruples. I'd just soon take what the Spanish officers tell us is happening. A war correspondent should correspond about a war. What can I do? You know, Wilders, give me a pass. There's no place for it to get me to. Senores, por favor. Oh, hello. Lieutenant Montes, isn't it? Si, senor. What's the word on the war today, Lieutenant? You are Richard Harding Davis, senor? Yeah, I am. General Wilder has sent me. Your request to see an action at first hand has been granted, senor. Really? If you will present yourself at the Cabana's fortress at dawn tomorrow, senor, you will be conducted to defeat. Now, that's more like it. Now we're talking. I'll be there, Lieutenant. Complete with field glasses. Understand, Lieutenant, you spoke of an engagement. Yes, yes, but the Spanish soldier does not fight with this rabble. What you are about to witness, Senor Davis, is a more usual event. The execution of one of the rabbits. That boy? Why, he's not old enough to smoke that cigarette. Why is he to be shot? As a matter of fact, I do not know. <laughs> and I do not care. What's his name? His name? What does it matter? Rodriguez, I think. Listo! Mira, Senor, you would like to take a look at the body? The cigarette. Still lit. Yeah, the boy's dead, all right. He's left a little flame burning. <laughs> little flame, still alive in the close presence of death. Richard Harding Davis sensed here might be the spark that someday would light the powder keg which would liberate Cuba. But before the smoke of the firing squad's powder was fairly out of his nostrils, he was off halfway around the world for his next war assignment in the Balkans. The campaign ribbons were beginning to line up on his military jacket. Then home, 
where he began reaching new heights as one of America's foremost journalists. When, one gray morning, clattering over the telegraph, came the electrifying news, U.S. battleship Maine sunk in Havana Harbor. Davis caught the first train for Tampa, Florida, where he waited for the chance to get across to the island with the soldiers. So you're here, are you, Davis? Well, I guess we can start the war in earnest now. Teddy Roosevelt. Oh, no, well, wait, wait, wait. Lieutenant Colonel Roosevelt, isn't it? I heard you were getting together a troop of irregulars. Don't stare at the Rough Riders, sir. It's an outfit of soldiers. By the way, what are you doing here with all the ordinary newspaper men? At last I heard you were watching this war from the bridge of Admiral Sampson's flagship. Well, sir, I was. It was too much like reporting the burning of the wall of Astoria from Brooklyn Bridge. Want to get closer to the fighting, do you? Aren't you afraid you're going to dirty your fine clothes? You forget, Colonel, I have campaigned in two wars already. Wars? You call those comic opera squabbles wars? Well, well, maybe as far as your newspapers are concerned, they were wars. All I can say is you'd better not get too close to the real thing. General Shafter, I see that the order for disembarkation directs that none but fighting men be allowed in the boats of the first landing party. What about it? But, sir, this will keep the reporters back. Mr. Davis, you're getting observant. But we should be permitted to be right in the thick of things, sir. Mr. Lord. Davis, will you please allow me as commanding officer of this expedition to run it as I see fit? If the Spaniards oppose our landing, I shall need every rifle I can get ashore to hold the beach. There's no room for reporters. But, General, I'm a special I don't give a hang what you are. They're all to go ashore after the beach has been taken. Davis, you here again? Hello, Colonel. It's easy to see the troops that are going to see action are your Rough Riders. I march with you? You've been in this country before, haven't you? Well, walk along with me and tell me something about it. He should be useful to fast, at least. Colonel. Uh, yes, Colonel. General Wood. I'm going to deploy the troops. I don't like the feel of marching through this jungle in close order. Our landing was so easy, I suspect a trap. Will you take charge of me? <laughs> Down! Cover, everybody! Take cover! Answer the fire! There they are. Take a look to your glass, Colonel. I'm going to tell some sharp shooters where they are. No, wait. Get under cover, everybody. The fire came from that tin shack, boys. Can you see it there from the trees? Take yeah. them off one by one. Good man. I'll be back in a minute. I'm in. What's the matter? My shoulder. It's got my shoulder. Let me take your blouse off. You feel better about it? Oh. Yeah. How's that? Well, thanks, mister. Now, you take it easy. Take it easy. Say, you won't need this gun for a bit. Let me have it. You cannot? Run your men. It's short. It's short. Davis? Yes, Colonel Roosevelt. I'm sorry I forgot to observe the rules for non-combatants, sir. That's not why I sent for you. I sent for you to apologize, sir, for what I said to you a month ago in Tampa. There was no man in the regiment who was more helpful to us on this day. No one who showed more courage. I did what I could, sir. Davis, you did a splendid job. I want to offer you a commission as a regular officer in the Rough Riders. I'm deeply appreciative, Colonel. But I don't think I can accept it. Nonsense. I'm a reporter, and I'm proud of my job, Colonel, just as I'm sure you are of yours. That's the reason I can't accept your offer. But I'll tell you this, sir. As long as I live, nothing will give me greater satisfaction than to know that I was with you and the Rough Riders at San Juan Hill. <laughs> Two more campaign ribbons on Richard Harding Davis's military jacket. One for the Spanish-American War and one for the Boer War. The century had turned, and still he followed the destiny of the blood-red star under which he'd been born. Assignment in Manchuria, the war between Russia and Japan, and for months he tried to make the sly, elusive Japanese allow him to get close enough to the fighting so that he could report it. Major Jockey... Ah, uh, yes, Mr. Davis? After being sent halfway around the world to cover this war of yours with Russia, I've been kept cooling my heels four months. Now you give me permission to come here to Manchuria. Why don't you let me through to the front to see this war of yours? Ah, uh, so sorry, Mr. Davis. 
Uh, but uh, there is uh, nothing to say at this time. Why can't you give us permission to go to the front and find that out for ourselves? Uh, when there is something to report, uh, you will be given permission to go. <laughs> I promise you, Mr. Davis. When will you know? Uh, very soon now. So far, you must wait. Look, Major, let me ask you this. According to my information, things are shaping up for a battle at Lea Yang. Lea Yang? Yeah. I tell you, it looks like a major battle. Biggest engagement of the whole war. Now, how about giving me a pass to watch that battle? Uh, unfortunately, uh, there is not and there will not be a battle at Lea Yang. Uh, the Russians withdrew immediately. The Mikado's troops took possession without a struggle. Without a struggle? No shot was fired. Is that the only place for to make a stand between here and... I am very sorry, Mr. Davis. Well, they've given up Lea Yang without a fight. This war's as good as over. That is true, Mr. Davis. I see. Well, in that event... I can't say I'm doing it with sorrow. I'm going to say goodbye to you, Major Taki, and I'd be very grateful if you could arrange to get me transportation to the China coast. Is this the office of the Chinese Telegraph Agency? Yes, sir. Good. There's no sign outside. I want to file a press dispatch. You are a war correspondent? Mm-hmm. I don't feel much like one at the moment. I must congratulate you. What for? Well, sir, you are the first to reach this office with the news of the great battle of Liaoyang. What are you talking about? Well, the major from the Japanese war office told me there was no battle. They have been fighting for six days. I can give you many details of the battle. Why should you do that for me? I am Chinese. The battle at Liaoyang goes badly for the Japanese. I am happy to send such a cable. You are listening to Claude Rains in Soldier of a Free Press, a new radio play on the Cavalcade of America, brought to you by DuPont, makers of better things for better living through chemistry. As our play continues, Richard Harding Davis, played by Claude Rains, has two more campaign ribbons on his military blouse. Still, he is the reporter of the world's wars. But all his previous assignments were simply the rehearsals for the assignment he was given in August 1914. At 11 o'clock this morning... I watched the city of Brussels occupied by the German army. Behind them, so close upon each other that to cross from one sidewalk to the other was impossible, came the Ulans, infantry, and the guns. No longer was it regiment of men marching, but something uncanny, inhuman, the force of nature like a landslide, a tidal wave, or lava sweeping down a mountain. It was not of this earth, but mysterious, ghost-like. It carried all the mystery and menace of a fog rolling toward you across the sea. For three days and three nights it roared and rumbled, a cataract of molten lead. To perfect this monstrous engine, to guide it, the minds of the German emperor's military autocracy, with whom it is a religion and a disease, had been solely concerned for years. It is, perhaps, the most efficient organization of modern times. And its only purpose is death. <laughs> all right, madam, all right, all right. There's nothing more to your story? No, monsieur, that is all. My husband and all my children, they are vanished. I have not seen them. Okay, what is there? it? Oh, these people. Oh, but I don't have passports. French. Oui, monsieur. Neil, let me see your passport. How the dickens do Germans get here? I thought you were miles back. The Sixth Third Army has occupied all this territory. Your passport. Here. Yeah. An American citizen. Oui, you step You're a lie. It's a British passport. No. You come with me. But I'm not British. I'm an American correspondent. Just because my You passport. are under arrest. You come with me. <laughs> Now then, 
concerned, Mr. Davis. I demand that you release me at once. I'm Richard Harding Davis, an American citizen and a war correspondent. You have memorized the facts on your passport very creditably. Do you think I'm lying? What do you take me for? You're an English officer out of uniform. You've been taken inside our lines. You've been following the movements of our army for the last six days. I followed your army because it's my business to follow armies. That, my dear British officer, is evident. Look here, you've got to believe me. All you need to do is to call the American ambassador. Why should I believe you? Your German pass has not been signed, only stamped. It's probably forged. Your American passport was issued not in Washington, but in London. The photograph of you in this passport shows you wearing a British uniform. I can explain that. The uniform was modeled on one worn by the West African Field Force during the Boer War. You expect me to believe that since then the British Army has, by a wild coincidence, decided to copy that precise uniform? Listen. If you can invent an explanation for the uniform as quickly as I told you that one, standing in this room before eight officers who want to shoot me, you'd be the greatest general in Germany. <laughs> Very well, then. Let us pretend that the entire British Army has changed its uniform to match yours. But if you are not an officer... Why does that photograph show you wearing war ribbons? Those ribbons prove me a correspondent. Only a war correspondent could have been in so many wars in which his own country was not engaged. Or a military attaché? All right. I'll make just one final suggestion. Will you give me a pass back to Brussels? A pass which says that I'm to be treated as a spy and shot on sight if I'm found off the direct road to Brussels or if I fail to make the 50 miles in 48 hours. Mm -hmm. Very pretty. Nice suggestion. It's now four o'clock in the afternoon. I would accept your proposal, Mr. Davis, on condition that you start at three o'clock in the morning. Three in the morning? Well, the first German sentry has told me would shoot me on sight at that hour. Those are my terms. Why don't you take me out and shoot me now? Your own idea will save us the trouble, Mr. Davis. <laughs> Jim, hmm? have you seen Dick Davis? No, I haven't seen him for days. I thought he went on field. Yeah, he did. But I imagine he'd been back by now. I was sure I'd find him over here at the American legation. All right. Hello, Joe. Davis. Wow. Well, what in the name of all that's holy have you been through? Look at your clothes. You hurt, man? You look like you've been fighting the whole German army. Well, you're not far from right. You picked me up and accused me of being a British spy. Now, let me go. They were sure that some sentry was going to shoot me. No, I don't know how I managed to get through. Well, Dick, you got here just in time. For what? Some Belgian peasants shot up a patrol of Germans near Levain this morning. Germans have announced they're going to take reprisals. What's that? Who's the general in command? Von Ludwig. He's over at the Grand Hotel now. Hey, where are you going? What do you think? See Von Ludwig. <laughs> They're to be shot. Get out of my way. Dick, come on, you fool. They'll arrest you. Yeah, but come on. There's my Ludwig's now. In that car there. General von Ludwig. Yeah. I'm an American correspondent. I've come to beg you to... I have no time to talk to you. The city will be in flames in a few minutes. Why have you allowed this outrage against civilization? I allowed it. I ordered it. Fifty of my soldiers were shot from ambush. In reprisal, we give the Belgians fine treatment. They understand but Louvain is a captured defenseless town. This is cold-blooded murder. General, it's a, it's, it's a violation of every precept of humanity and civilization. Mr. Davis, civilization, as you call it, is dead. You are a journalist, Mr. Davis. I am a soldier. Write and tell your civilized world that the German army is making a new kind of civilization. Well, you're right about one thing, General. I am a journalist. And the show is there's a heaven above us. Americans will read my story of this atrocity and rise up against you. I'll write my story, General, and you and your devil-infected legions will get your due. I promise you that. To write.
sight of the German danger that lay before his country in 1916 was not enough for Davis. He returned home filled with horror and foreboding to devote all his time and energy to the cause he believed in so sincerely. In his home near New York in April 1916, his wife finds him writing late at night. Dick, Dick are you still working? Well, I've been finished in a few minutes, Dick. Oh, but Dick, can't it wait until tomorrow? You've been working too hard, much too hard. I'm worried about you. I know. You can't wait. Too much to do. I'm no longer a reporter, Bessie. I've got more to do than just tell the story. I've got to point it. You know, never before in all my life have I felt so charged with grave responsibility. But darling, it can wait until tomorrow. No, it is waiting until tomorrow in Europe. The Germans are on a rampage, and America's got to be warned. This is our fight, they say. No one will see it. There's no border or trade dispute over there. It's aimed at us. Our liberties. You and me. And the rest of the world who oppose them. Listen, Bessie. This is the purpose of my book. That the Allies succeed should be the hope and prayer of every American. The fight they are waging is for the things every American is supposed to hold most high and most dear. They are fighting his fight. And this fight is all part of a greater struggle which will end for all time frightfulness and despotism and win a broader civilization a nobler freedom and a much more pleasant world in which to live. The appeal Richard Harding Davis wrote that night of 1916 was the last weapon of words he would support. For that night, he died. But the tradition he created as a war correspondent lives on. The tradition of that group of correspondents who today are present on every battle scene as the eyes of the world, permitting nothing to stand in their way of getting the news for Americans at home. Such is the heritage of Richard Harding Davis. First, Last and always, a true soldier of the press, a free press. Cavalcade players will present Eagle for Britain, an exciting dramatization of the flight of an American bomber across the Atlantic Ocean on its way to the battlefront. It's the story of a typical flight of a flying crew of the Air Transport Command whose pledge is the ship must be delivered. With us, we will have a pilot of the Ferry Command as guest on the program. The orchestra and original score tonight were under the personal direction of Don Bury. This is Clayton Collier sending best wishes from our sponsor, the DuPont Company. This program came to you from New York. This is the National Broadcasting Company.